Jasmine creció en Salinas, California. Es orgullosa de ser chicana de primera generación con un doctorado proveniente de una comunidad no representada. Tiene como eh, objetivo servir como modelo y mentor para estudiantes de diversos orígenes en búsqueda de la educación superior. Obtuvo su doctorado en Biología Evolutiva en la Universidad de Harvard y eh, investiga la evolución de los murciélagos. Actualmente eh, trabaja en, en Harvard, eh, continuando con investigando el, el, los mismos temas. Ahora voy a leer su biografía en inglés para, para describir todo lo que nos platicó. Uh, Jasmine was born in, and raised in Salinas, California, and is, a proud, is, and is proud to be a first generation Chicana scholar from an, an underserved community. She aims to serve as a role model and mentor to students from diverse backgrounds in the pursuit of higher education. As an evolutionary biologist, she's interested in exploring extreme mammalian adaptations for insights into organismal features that become informative targets for repairing and protecting human health. She's currently performing research in the Tavin lab at Harvard University investigating the evolution of bats. Um, she, she received her PhD in Harvard Organismic and Evolutionary Biology program in the tab lab of, do, of Dr. Har, Arhat Abshanov, <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Uh, and her long-term aim is to uncover the cellular and molecular mechanisms implicated in the adaptations of extraordinary, extraordinary mammals. So let's join us. And thank you, Jasmine, for taking the time to prepare this talk. We are very happy to have you back. Uh, also, Jasmine was an uh, uh, instructor of Club de Ciencia in 2018 in Ensenada. And we are very happy to, to keep this collaboration with her. And welcome, Jasmine, and you can you can start. Yeah, thank you so much for that kind introduction. And my advisor's uh, PhD um, is Arha Abzanov. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I'm really excited uh, to be invited to talk about bats uh, through this webinar series. So, um, I mean, hi, I'm Jasmine. And let's get learning more about bats and uh, as well as the SARS uh, coronavirus too. So in this talk, we're going to learn a few things. So we're going to learn about the origins of COVID-19, the origins of the virus behind COVID-19 uh, through a, this idea of an intermediate host. And we're going to cover why bats uh, should not be blamed. Um, so I want to convince you why instead bats should be celebrated. And hopefully by the end of this talk, you're gonna have a cool set of uh, facts about bats that you can share uh, with your family and your friends. So we are in a pandemic. Uh, so it first started as a cluster of cases in Wuhan, China. So within a week of the first case, Chinese scientists had already submitted the entire genomic sequence of this virus um, so that we can identify what, what it is. So this means that the genetic material inside the virus uh, could be identified. And so we learned that it's a novel coronavirus so this has not yet been seen in nature, uh, but we do know about coronaviruses. So they are these RNA viruses that have these specialized proteins, these spike proteins that line the surface. Um, so I'm gonna figure out how I can share my um, pointer with you. I completely forgot how to do this, but anyway, so there are these red, um, goblet shapes on the outside of the cell, and that is what gives coronaviruses their characteristic look. So when you can see them under a microscope, they kind of resemble what is called the solar corona. So when you see them in the microscope, they kind of look like this, and that's where they get their name from. So this coronavirus is what is 
behind uh, COVID-19, which is, you know, a deadly uh, viral pneumonia in some people. So we know that it can transmit um, human to human, that's how it spreads, and it can spread very, very rapidly. So when it comes to emerging diseases, most of the time they are going to be from an animal origin. So by most of the time, I mean 75% of the time that we expect these emerging human diseases to be from an animal. So this is a zoonotic disease. So basically an animal virus can move and become a human <laughs> virus. Um, sorry, that's my dog if you hear him in the background. Um, so when a human virus or when a pathogen from an animal is uh, transmitted from, um, to a human, that is called a zoonotic disease. So many animals are known to be a source of human disease. Uh, so a few examples of this, in, especially in vertebrates, so animals with a backbone, um, this event is called a zoonotic spillover. And for example, we know this from rodents. So rodents can you know, transmit the plague. We know this from pigs. Pigs can transmit um, influenza. Uh, birds as well, they are what is caring um, for the West Nile virus. Uh, we know from chimpanzees that they were the source for um, human immunodeficiency virus. And yes, we even know that for bats, they can also be a source of rabies, which causes brain inflammation. Yet, it really remains unclear to us uh, which animal is the source of the current uh, coronavirus pandemic. So uh, from a recent study uh, just published um, this month, uh, we know that within mammals, uh, it's estimated that there are about 40,000 viruses. Um, and from these 40,000 viruses, it's estimated that about 25% of those, which ends up being around 10,000 viruses, have potential to cross into humans. So potentially there could be a zoonotic spillover occurring, and maybe this happens up to um, 10,000 times. But really, um, it's important to know then if this can happen, which mammals are likely to transmit those viruses to us. So what we can do is we can inform, um, make an association of these viruses and where they are occurring in nature. And what the authors of this study did, they were able to map out and create this network of association of viruses to the host that they were present in. So what I'm showing you here is a network map. And here on one end, you have these cooler blue colors. Um, and then you also have those colors of the key showing with the silhouette of a different animal. So the cooler the color, this means that the viruses are uh, showing a stronger association of being shared uh, between those hosts. So to highlight, um, most of the viruses, so most of the virus sharing is happening in a subset of mammals. So those are the bats, um, those are primates, those are ungulates like uh, cows, those are rodents, and those are like carnivores, like would you imagine like a wolf or a coyote or something. Um, so given all this potential of mammals have for potentially, you know, transmitting disease, you know, why then are bats so often the first ones uh, to blame for transmitting disease? Um, so one of these reasons this happens has nothing to do with science. Really, bats, unfortunately, just are generally associated with evil um, itself. So Dante, for example, described Lucifer as having six wings, but these are now dark and bat-like. And we just know from culture that bats themselves are generally symbolized, they're used as a symbol for like death or somehow like the land of the dead. So they just have this association to darkness and dark things about life. But 
there's also the truth that, you know, there that bats are very diverse. There are a lot of different types of bats. And in fact, 20% of all mammals are a bat. So one out of every five species of mammal is represented as a bat. Um, so rodents, of course, are, are more, there are more rodents than there are bats. But this, this idea that because there's more bats, potentially maybe they also can have a higher chance of having um, like a virus. Another reason bats are sometimes targeted is uh, because of their distribution. So the 1400 species of bats are located all over the world and they are overlapping in regions where another species occupies most of the world, ourselves. So where you see bats, you are also gonna see humans. Something else about bats is they are present in large numbers. Um, a few species like to live in colonies, and these colonies have millions of bats that are close to one another, and they share a small space. So this is kind of like a perfect setting for potentially the, to have the virus uh, sharing between the different bat species, as well as any other species that is living within that cave system as well. Bats are also, of course, the only mammal that is capable of true flight. So this means it's easy for them to move around and they can move around into spaces that are occupied by humans more easily. And potentially that gets them in contact uh, with us, maybe having more of a chance to transmit a disease to us. But really these, things that make them so special also really have nothing to do with whether they can transmit uh, the virus or have more viruses to transmit. So a study that was done looking at uh, different um, viral species and looking at the different hosts of those species found a relationship where you have more viruses found when you have more species present. And we see that bats fall along this trend. They don't stand out. There's nothing special really about them when it comes to the number of viruses they have. But of course, they are very diverse. And because bats are diverse, then they will have a diverse set of viruses present. Again, it's nothing higher than you would expect from any other mammal, but because they are very diverse, we're gonna um, expect them to have more uh, viruses. But just because you have a virus, just because they have viruses circulating in populations, that does not really mean that they spread disease. So these are things that are, these are viruses present in bats, not viruses that are going back to human. So that's not, we don't know those things yet. So while, again, while there's a potential to infect, um, it's, it's a rare event for this to happen. So because it's so rare historically, like the fact that we, we are currently experiencing a pandemic suggests something bizarre is going on. And if we're removing barriers between humans and wild animals, that's only gonna increase our risk for encountering, you know, potentially those 10,000 viruses that can spill over into humans. And what we know is that there is a lot of um, illegal hunting and consumption of wild animals. And these, these events put these animals into proximity to ourselves. Um, and this is right now the kind of what it's thought about the current pandemic where some of the first cases were traced back to this seafood market where there were wild animals for sale. So to figure out what caused COVID-19, you have to go back to the source. So those first cases were 
trace to that market. What we can do is also look at the virus present in the first patients and see where did it come from. So again, you can take the genetic material out of the virus. In this case, this is an RNA virus. So RNA is very similar to DNA, except it's only a single strand. You can take that RNA and sequence it and figure out what it is. And again, we found that this was something new in our, in our environment. And this, was, this virus was causing this severe acute respiratory syndrome, and it's a coronavirus. So it was aptly named uh, SARS coronavirus 2. So we're just going to be calling it SARS. I'm just going to shorthand call it SARS 2 um, throughout this talk, but this is um, the virus that we're talking about. So, okay, now we know what it is. Now the next step is to figure out where did that come from? So we can uh, figure that out by saying what is most similar to it? So what other coronavirus is similar to this one? This is something you do when you're trying to figure out more about your own origins. You say, okay, this is who I am. Here's my cousins. Through them, can I figure out who my grandmother is? Most of the time, yes. Yes, you can. And this is what we're doing for the, the SARS-2 uh, virus. We want to know what is most closely related to. So again, we have the sequence. Um, so what we're looking at here is a graph showing us the genome nucleotide position at the bottom of the graph. This again is going to be the sequence. Then we have on the axis, um, the y-axis is something called nucleotide um, identity. So this is going to tell us how similar is it to, the, to SARS um, coronavirus 2. So the top says 100. 100 means this is 100% similar to uh, this coronavirus. The bottom zero means it's not going to be similar. And right away you see at the top this orange line here. This, there's something already in nature that is very similar to the SARS uh, coronavirus too. And it is 96% similar. And we know where it was sampled, we know where it came from, and here it matches to this bat coronavirus. So we discovered so far that the closest relative of SARS coronavirus 2 is a coronavirus that was isolated from bats. And we know the species of bat, it's this horseshoe bat um, that it was isolated from, and it was taken out of a sample um, in 2013 from a, from a cave. So we can now compare these two, the human coronavirus sample to the bat coronavirus sample, and we see we can um, recreate and say, okay, they are maybe 40 to 70 years apart. And we can know this just by how different they are from each other. And when we, so to simplify this, we can say, um, here are the changes that happened, which is around a 4% you know, difference. And I mean, it doesn't sound like much, only 4% different doesn't sound like much is happening. But when we think about it ourselves, we think about how closely related our ancestor might have been. So we are most closely related to chimpanzees and our own genomic material is only 1% different from a chimpanzee. So again, the coronavirus that's present in humans, 96% similar to the bat, but our own genome itself is 99% similar to a chimpanzee. And we know we're very different, right? We're not saying we're the same. And it's the same that we can think about these viruses. So they are very different from each other. And so this is one of the main ideas where we know like the bat coronavirus is not what is causing uh, COVID-19. So this direct transmission idea is just really improbable, just based on um, what we know so far about, about the genome of these two viruses. Another thing we know about bat coronaviruses is that they have a hard time entering into human cells. 
So again, uh, the coronavirus is covered by these spikes. And these spikes are what is binding to receptors that are present on a human cell. This needs to happen for the virus to get into the cell. So if the bat virus doesn't have the right receptor, it will not be able to enter into the human cell. And that is what we know from the bats as well, that their coronaviruses are not able to easily cross into human cells. So that's, again, the most important thing about these coronaviruses are their spike proteins. That is what allows it to bind and enter and make humans sick. Um, so it's a special protein. I don't, you might have heard about it with the news, um, ACE2. This is the main target in a lot of vaccines for, uh, for COVID-19 as well. Um, so to summarize everything that we just learned, we know bats are not transmitting COVID-19. We know that the SARS uh, coronavirus 2 is a new virus and it's related to the bat coronavirus. And we know the first few cases are linked to this uh, seafood market in China. So we know, okay, so we know this 96% similar and it's related to a bat virus, but it's different enough not to be the source for COVID-19. So we can look now at the part that is different, that 4% difference. Where is it occurring? And can we figure out where that piece is coming from? What is most closely related to that piece? So again, we're looking at that similarity map and we are looking at that part where, uh, where the graphs just dip. They form this depression in the graph. And that region relates to part of the virus sequence that encodes for that spike protein. And again, that spike protein is what is really important for this virus to be working. And it's why these viruses look the way they do. And we know that that's the part that's different between um, the humans and the bats. So then what is it? What is it most similar to? So you can take that particular region and look, because we have, again, the, we have viruses from different animals, we have databases, and we can figure out where is this sequence most closely related to. And in fact, what we're going to look at now is a similarity plot, but this time, instead of looking at the similarity to the SARS uh, coronavirus 2, we're going to be looking at the sequence of a Malayan pangolin. So these mammals are very fascinating themselves. They're mammals that have these scales on them, these carotene scales. And this animal was thought to be a um, probable source for a coronavirus. So that's kind of like why we had this information to start. And when you take the pangolin coronavirus and you compare it to other coronaviruses, so here again, we're looking at spike protein, we can see again at the top of the graph where sequences are very similar and we can see where sequences are different. And we see in the blue and the pink, so the blue relates to the SARS coronavirus 2 in humans. The pink relates to that coronavirus circulating in bats. And you see the pink and the blue, they're very close matching to each other until you see a dip where they separate. And where the bat and human coronavirus separate, that's the area that is most similar to the pangolin uh, sequence. So that's very, interesting to have this. And that particular area of the spike protein in that coronavirus is actually this um, short functional region and it's called the receptor binding motif. So this is a part of the virus that is important for being able to bind. So a receptor will bind onto another um, a protein and it's going to be like a, a lock and key. So let's say this is the receptor, here's the spike protein, and this is where they will match each other. 
So this is the part that was really interesting. It's very exciting. All of this is really new information for us. Um, so now we have this better idea of what the virus is. We know it's mostly similar to the bat coronavirus sequence, but in its spike sequence, it's most similar to the pangolin. And again, the ability for the spike to bind onto surface receptors and cells is what allows it to give humans the infection. Um, so now we have this idea of what is referred to as an intermediate host hypothesis, where it, we have um, something that might have first originated from bats, but then something between bats, likely the pangolin, and humans happened. So this coronavirus has this ability to uh, change and acquire new traits that make it um, a really good human um, disease virus. So this idea of an intermediate host hypothesis is not anything new. And in fact, the original um, SARS outbreak in 2003 was a documented case where a horseshoe bat spilled over, had his virus spill over and come into contact with this palm civet. And then this palm civet was able to uh, transmit and spill over into humans, causing the SARS outbreak. The same thing happened in 2012 with the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, where a bat virus spilled over into a camel, and then the camel was what transmitted to humans. So this is also probably, you know, what is happening with, um, with the coronavirus and COVID-19 today, where the intermediate host hypothesis is proposing that the trafficked uh, pangolin uh, was the way in which humans acquired uh, COVID-19. But okay, but this doesn't really answer for us how the virus ended up with bat similarity and pangolin similarity. How can a virus take on these properties? Um, so now we're gonna shift gears into talking more about what is happening within a cell. So every organism has cells in its body and each of those cells has potential to come into contact with the virus and become infected. When a virus infects a cell, the cell can then make more of the virus basically. So that's how viruses work. Um, so in this case, we're thinking about the pangolin. Here I just diagrammed a pangolin cell. And we're just imagining what might have happened for this intermediate host hypothesis to make sense. So we're thinking that in pangolins, that they, had a, they already have a coronavirus circulating in them. So in one of the cells, there's a coronavirus that was isolated from you know, another pangolin. And somehow this pangolin came in contact with the bat and this bat virus was able to somehow enter into the pangolin cell. So now you have two viruses in one cell and both of these viruses are really good at making more copies of themselves and so that's what they do. Um, they replicate and make more of themselves within a cell and most of the time they're good at this but they make mistakes on occasion. Um, so this allows viruses to mutate and change and become different viruses. But what also can happen is sometimes when one virus is replicating and it's similar to another virus, the portions that are similar might overlap with the other virus. And so instead of just copying from its own DNA, it might accidentally copy from the other virus and then incorporate another part of a virus into its own um, sequence. So if that happens, you get a new virus that has a diff that has different properties. Now it has mostly the same virus or same sequence in the virus, but it has from the different uh, virus. So here I diagrammed this as being new. So this new virus 
for it to succeed, it's going to have to also make more of itself and replicate in the cell, uh, which, you know, it has to do if we're thinking about this virus and how it relates to COVID-19. Um, so it seems like what might have happened is that we had this bat coronavirus that might have entered into a pangolin and it incorporated a portion of the receptor binding motif of the spike protein. So you have a mostly bat-like coronavirus, I'm showing here in blue, but on the spike protein, it mostly looks like the pangolin sequence. So that's the idea for what is called a viral recombination. So uh, what we do know now is there's no virus right now in nature found in any mammal that is identical 100% to the SARS um, coronavirus 2. There might be another sequence out there that's maybe 99% similar, but we don't know. Um, that's just a sampling thing. So we just have to keep going out and uh, sequencing more viruses to kind of ID a better idea. But um, we know at least that the spike protein on the coronavirus, that small portion of the spike protein, that binding motif, resembles the pangolin sequence. And again, we think that this is happening, this event happened likely at a wildlife market where you're going to have bats and pangolins and humans all together. Um, but again, this is just all hypothesis um, where, you know, as scientists, we can just take the information that we have and try to make sense as best as we can. Uh, so this is just, again, my interpretation of events so far. Um, so, you know, all that negative press BATS received at the start was based a lot on misinformation and our own biases um, that associate them, you know, with demons and with death. So I want to like change now and talk about all of the wonderful um, contributions bats have to our lives. I mean, I get to work with them every day. So this is just a small little snippet of some of the things that I consider to be really uh, special about them. So first of all, uh, bats are really important into our environments. Um, so here we're seeing this uh, fruit bat hanging out in a tree and you can find them in forest canopies all over the world, especially in the tropics. Um, and what they do is they pollinate a lot of the, the flowers of the trees. They'll disperse a lot of seeds of trees too, so they can repopulate a forest. So you're seeing here on the left, a forest that has gone awry through invasive plants that's just kind of killing everything. But we can imagine with bats being able to go through and drop native seeds around that that's going to make the ecosystem healthier and it's going to repair a lot of damage that, you know, we do. So bats can take care of our mistakes. Another thing that I find really wonderful about them is that they can pollinate things. So they are nectar eating bats. They have really slender and long faces with long tongues to get into those flowers. And they are basically pollinating flowers at night, the same way that bees do during the day. So they are really important. We know we have to save the bees, but you know we have to also save the bats. They're both working toward making our ecosystems uh, really healthy. And just nectar bats too. I had to have multiple slides of nectar bats because they are the cutest. Um, they can pollinate so many plants and especially plants that we love. So I had a banana as a snack. Thank you bats. They're the ones that are pollinating them. Um, they also can pollinate uh, fig plants, mangoes, these durian plants. Um, and they do this for over 400 different species. So they do so much for, for us. Um, another wonderful thing, especially considering um, the agave plant in Mexico. So the agave is pollinated by this Mexican long-tongue bat, this leptonicroderous bat, 
And this is important for keeping the health of agave. So there is something called bat-friendly agave or bat-friendly tequila. And that means a portion of the crop, of the agave crop, is set aside for bat pollination. And most of the time when you have crops, you just cut a piece of a plant, it can grow another plant. And this is kind of like a clonal propagation. So you have the same plant just multiplied. It's all the same plant. But what happens when that plant gets sick? It can get wiped out. But if you have variation in the plants, maybe one plant is going to be resistant. And so you don't lose your whole crop if you have the ability to generate a diversity of different types of plants. And so it's the idea that bats themselves can pollinate and keep the agave healthy uh, for our future. And, you know, mezcal and tequila, you know, they're magical elixirs that are really celebrated throughout the world. And I think especially um, thinking of the positive things that can happen when you take care of bats is you can keep these types of industries sustainable and going um, and you can keep sharing with the world, you know, these wonderful things. And this is an example of a bat-friendly tequila. There's now an effort through UNAM to um, kind of approve different um, agave products as being bat-friendly so we can support the bats in, in small, like everyday little steps. Another thing that bats are wonderful at is restoring and regenerating forests. So I mentioned this a little before, but they can take the fruit, they eat it, and they just drop the seeds around. And so this is a process of planting. So they'll just go flying around doing their business and just, you know, regrow a forest that's been cleared, for example. So here I'm showing you an example of one of the many things that happens where forests are destroyed, either intentionally for clearing purposes or maybe accidental. But bats are really important as well as birds for you know repopulating these damaged regions another wonderful thing bats do is they eat insects so a study was done actually looking at the crop yields in cocoa plantations so you know cacao plants they're really important for making chocolate so if you love chocolate you know bats you could thank bats for this as well they do a lot of damage to the insects that will then um, eat, you know, and damage the plant itself. But if you remove the, um, if you remove the bats, you're going to see a dramatic decrease in the yield of your crop. But if you keep plants around, then the, then the plantations do much better in terms of their yield. So bats are very important. Um, they save about $800 million in the U.S. in terms of, like, if you want to put a value on what they can do, what they do is really important for our crops. And just, they also keep us healthy. They can eat a ton of mosquitoes, and we know mosquitoes, they can spread disease. So if they can get rid of those mosquitoes, keep them from biting you, that, you know, is... It's a good thing for me uh, to have them around. Um, so here's the riparian myotis. They can eat a ton of mosquitoes. Um, and finally, um, bats have been used in a lot of biomedical studies, really. So if we think about the future of medicine, I think we should start thinking more about bats because they are just really cool mammals with a lot of bizarre traits. And some people have started to do this already. So we know that bats um, have exceptionally long lives. They can live, they're so small, like a little mouse, yet they can live for really long. Um, they have resistance to cancer. They don't get cancer. So how is this possible? They can also be resistant to diseases. So they can get infections with viruses, but they don't show symptoms. Like, how is this possible? This is amazing. And we can also use them to design and think about robotics. So there's been a, 
a bat robot going around. Um, and mostly it's just, you know, being able to study how bat flies, they're very maneuverable. They move around so easily. So we can design like these robots that can also move around more easily too. So they have a potential to really transform the way that we see and use and learn from, from our, our own world. Um, most importantly too, we know that bats have many, um, so bats do have viruses, and again, they don't get sick from them. So we might be able to look to them for a solution for like people who do get sick from COVID-19. Imagine we can stop that from happening. So you get the infection, but you don't get sick. So I think bats can hold the key for studying um, a mechanism to prevent us from getting sick very sick, even though we have this, um, this virus circulating. So for me, bats have so much to teach us. And I think we need to do our best to protect them and to keep them safe so that, you know, we can just be fascinated by their continue bizarre looking uh, faces. At least I love looking at their faces, but you know, they have a lot of really neat things, uh, neat features to learn from. So just to wrap up and conclude, um, for sure we can say that COVID-19 is not transmitted uh, by bats. It's something that gets transmitted from one human to another human. It is likely an intermediate host that is the source for the SARS uh, coronavirus 2. And Again, bats are very beneficial to us and to our ecosystem. So with that, I have, um, I would like to take any questions you have and I would just love to talk more about bats. So please, thank you for um, listening with me so far. And I will check now for questions in the Q&A. Um, I'm not sure if there's a way for me to see you. Let's see how this works. Um, thank you, Yasmin, for this beautiful talk. It was really nice to learn about the the many contributions that bats do to our world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, like I could keep going, but I know you wanted me to stick to forty minutes, otherwise. No, I just... no, no, no. Yeah, <laughs> of course. No, I know that you you can keep going. Um, <laughs> So you have a question about where to see the questions in the Q&A? Oh, yeah, I see them. I pulled them up now. I'm okay, great. Thank you. Uh, okay, so should I read the questions then? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so I have one question at the top here. Uh, just like we are capable of negatively impacting our environment, can we indirectly somehow affect the immune system of animals and therefore make them more susceptible to novel viruses by our aggression infusion for resources and livestock oh that's a complex one. Oh, it's a two-part question and then it's okay so i'll answer the first part and then i'll read the i'll go over the second part uh right now there is a hiatus on bat research because we are worried that at least in terms of COVID and this is probably true for other viruses as well is we are vectors too. Remember I showed that hosts network map and humans are primates we're there we can also transmit um, diseases and it's been shown that in uh, wild uh, or in tigers that are in zoos they've been infected with COVID-19 and tigers got it from humans because there's no like there's no bat flying around it's a, it was human visitors who gave a tiger COVID-19 um, and there's been reports of house cats getting viruses from human um, and as a bat community we're worried that actually we might give bats viruses too so it's totally possible that because we are putting ourselves more in close proximity to wild animals that we can transmit these um, viruses to them so the second part of the question is are we 
are we the ones to blame? Um, in your opinion, what changes do you see in regards to protecting and maintaining barriers between humans and other animal species? Well, definitely there's this effort to protect the environment, to, um, you know, keep, like there's certain caves now in, in Mexico that are protected and they're protected for the animals, for bats. Um, they, I think there's efforts all over like Mexico and the United States, Europe, to make sure that we can protect the habitat of the animals because if we keep encroaching on them that's a really dangerous situation to put ourselves in not only to the animals but these animals now can then come out of their habitat and go into human habitats like i'm from california so we have the problem of like mountain lions coming into town when they can't find food or their water runs low because they'll get closer to where humans are because we have the resources. So these same things are happening. So we have to, I mean, we're trying to do our best, right? As the scientific community, um, as you know, people who care about the environment to make sure those resources are there for animals. Okay, so can SARS, um, coronavirus to mutate if, oh it's moving as i read it <laughs> okay can sars coronavirus 2 mutate affecting the global race for a vaccine that's a great question so right now coronaviruses yes they do mutate and they change but it's slow so we think of something like HIV. We've been trying to make a vaccine for this for so long, but we are having so much trouble because it's a quickly mutating virus. Compared to that, the SARS coronavirus 2 is a slow mutating virus. So actually it's a really great candidate for developing a vaccine. And I think we're nearly there. There's a vaccine trial happening. Um, it just went through phase one clinical trials. It's jumping through phase two. So it's very, very promising. And I don't think it is mutating uh, fast enough for it to be ineffective. So I think if it does change, it will be a small tweak in the vaccine, kind of like what we do for the flu vaccine, but because it's a slow uh, mutation rate. Okay, so. Okay, hold on. There's a question in Spanish that I need to translate. ¿Qué diferencia hay entre el sistema inmune de los murciélagos y el de los humanos? Oh, that's a great question. So what are the differences in the immune system between bats and humans? Oh, there's a lot of interesting differences. Uh, one of the main differences, though, I can think of for now is the natural killer cell population in bats is more diverse than humans. So we just, bats have more ways of, in terms of their um, adaptive immune response or their innate immune response uh, once it gets uh, infected with the virus. So they have more types of cells that can deal with it. Um, there's many other adaptation adaptations and I'm happy to also uh, share like papers and resources um, later. If there's a way to share the, my slides as well, I can put those. Okay. Um, so how, oh, oops, sorry. How long does the viral recombination take to create a new virus? Um, that's a good question. Potentially, you know, it can happen within a few hours, right? But the idea would be, is that recombined virus uh, viable? Can it make more of itself? So it has to be a very a special set of circumstances where um, if there is a mutation, that new virus is able to still uh, replicate itself if it and then if it does replicate itself once it um, gets out of one cell is it even going to be able to infect another cell so it is something 
that if it happens, it happens within one host. So it can happen very quickly. Um, and on a time scale, I'm not actually sure, uh, but I think RNA can replicate and assemble a virus uh, very quickly. But I don't have the numbers, but I can look it up and answer more specifically uh, when I look into when I look into it. Okay. Um, so how similar is ACE2 from pangolin to human ACE2? Can SARS-2 infect pangolin cells? Ooh, that's a great question. So, um, okay, it's multi-part question. So human and pangolin ACE2 receptors, are they similar? One, I don't know that because I have not looked actually at the ACE2 receptors. Um, all I know is that the uh, pangolin coronavirus has a receptor binding motif that can recognize ACE2. So likely, since it is also infecting the cells of pangolins, that that sequence is probably similar. But we can look it up. Uh, we can look up those sequences and then compare them. Um, and can SARS-2 infect pangolin cells? Um, my best guess is yes, mostly because we know that SARS-2, um, so this really cool experiment was done recently where the, um, there were some stem cells that were isolated out of a bat gut. This bat gut uh, was then dissociated and the stem cells were isolated. And there's this really cool experiment that you can do where you can take a stem cell and, ice, and grow them with um, different growth factors. And what you end up with something is called an organoid structure. So this is just a kind of like a mini, I wanna say like a, a mini organ in a dish but it lacks like complexity, right? So it's gonna be this really simple um, three-dimensional structure. And so it can make something that looks like a gut, but it isn't really a gut. So this gut organoid in a bat was made and what the, and what the scientists did in the study was they infected that bat gut organoid with the SARS-CoV-2. And the bat gut cells did get infected. So I think if the bats um, that have the very similar coronavirus, right, 96% similarity, they can be infected with SARS CoV 2. And that was shown experimentally with, in the gut system. Um, so I, maybe pangolins also can get it but that experiment hasn't been done of course because they're rare and endangered but likely uh, i would say yes especially if their ace2 receptors are the same then if it can bind the same mechanism then it can enter the cell and become infected uh, okay Um, okay, so this question from Carlos. Nowadays, we suppose that pangolin is the intermediate host between human and bats, but what happens if the hypothesis is wrong? The scientists are looking for another intermediate host. Um, yes, that is very true. So again, this is just a hypothesis. All we are going on is sequence similarity. The sequences could be similar just by chance. Um, we know that viruses change, their, they can change rapidly, so it could just be a matter of chance that it happens to be the same exact sequence. So we, I mean, if it does, if we sequence more coronaviruses and we find one that's even closer, and maybe it's in a bat species, that would be just really interesting to know, and it's important that we try to figure out these things so we can try to prevent them from happening again in the future. So I don't want it to be a pangolin, but you know, that's kind of how the pieces fit at the moment. So even if we do not have to blame bats, do you think after the pandemic, um, 
Uh, where can we get to see bats? Um, you think those tourist activities will change? I think at the moment, um, the efforts to engage the public by looking at bats, either through uh, seeing them emerge out of caves, I think those are really important things to maintain because they just, one, it just fills you with this inspiration. You see all these bats emerge and it's an experience that I think is very special uh, to be able to see bats and to be able to see such a large amount of bats at once. Oh, the, to me, that's like one of the best things you can do. And it's important that we aren't saying like, we should be going out and touching bats and getting close to them. Like we need to appreciate them from a distance. Just like when you go on a hike, you know, stay on the trail, enjoy the views, don't go and carve up the forest and do your own thing. Like when you get tourist events that celebrate the diversity, um, and if they're celebrating the diversity of bats, like I think those things are good. They are usually overseed and mostly you are being safe with yourself and with the animals. So I don't think that's going to change. I hope if anything, this makes it, makes people more aware of the potential dangers of, you know, interacting with wild animals and just staying away. Like don't get closer just to try to get a good selfie, you know, just keep your distance. And, you know, I think uh, these things uh, uh, will unfold and I'm sure we'll get back to um, somewhat of a normal semblance, but these tourist activities, I think maybe people are even gonna demand like, hey, no, we shouldn't do that, which is what I hope comes out of it. Okay. Um. Okay, what are the features in innate and adaptive immune system in bats that make them resistant to some other viruses, uh, such as rabies or Ebola virus? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, I, I have to look up exactly what it is. I know in, for Ebola virus, the natural killer cells are really important aspects. Uh, for rabies, I, I'm not 100% certain what's going on, um, but they, the idea is that when bats fly, they experience, their physiology experiences a state that's really similar to an inflammation state. So inflammation is part of this um, adaptive immune response is what happens when you encounter something foreign and you get this series of reactions that happen. Um, well, I guess it's a combination of the innate and the adaptive kind of working together. But when a bat is flying around, its physiology is really similar to um, some of the inflammatory effects in other mammals. So the idea is that bats can just tolerate being at that high level, like that um, high heart rate. So you get the cardiac arrhythmia, you get the high uh, body temperature. And this state that's normally a sickness state in, in us and other mammals, for bats, it's kind of like their normal, like what they are used to when they go flying around. Um, so there's the idea that because they can fly, they're just their whole body is just kind of more tolerant of having the virus. And so they don't experience that illness because that illness is like kind of like their status quo, if you will. Um, another thing is they might be more effect, efficient at repairing their bodies because they fly. So there's these ideas floating around of like, maybe they're really good at repairing their cells, you know? So it, we still don't know, right? There's a lot questions here that are great and I wish I had answers to. Um, so far we just kind of sequence their genomes and kind of compare them like okay what do we know about them but we're not taking their cells like in the lung for example we're not taking those and looking at what what is it doing when it encounters a virus like we don't know.
Okay. So how can one virus, how can a virus go from one species to another? Um, I mean, there's the ecological um, idea where you can have just a spillover event where a virus can just move and jump into another um, species without changing itself. It's just a, kind of like an opportunistic encounter and it just happens to be that it can infect another another type of animal. So there's that proximity hypothesis. Um, for the virus itself, it has to, like a virus in an animal is really adapted for that particular animal. So it's good at infecting the animal. If the animal encounters another species, that virus may like get the animal sick and replicate, but not as well as it would in the original host. And over time in that secondary host, it might start to replicate and change. And just through like chance, it's gonna mutate enough to maybe be better at replicating. And so then that virus will change enough so that it becomes um, really effective in that secondary host. So that's kind of the idea of how viruses move around um, between different uh, species. In the intermediate host hypothesis, how did pangolins get infected from bats? So we don't know. It could be that a pangolin, um, let's say, in its natural environment, maybe a bat flew over and because we know that from the bat coronavirus that was isolated from that horseshoe bat in 2013 from the cave that was isolated from a fecal sample so we know the virus is present in the feces or the guano and what's called in bats is guano the virus is there so it could be like maybe the pangolin came into contact with the guano of a bat it could be that maybe, like, let's say it was that the COVID-19 did emerge out of the seafood market. It could be that a pangolin that was um, illegally trafficked to that market could have came in contact with the urine, the blood, saliva, or feces from another bat that was killed at that market. Um, so, you know, we don't really know exactly um, but those are some of the ways so any body fluid is going to or fecal matter is going to be able to uh, transmit a virus so why is it important now the identity of the intermediate host so the intermediate host hypothesis just came out of the fact that there was a pangolin sequence that matched the um, SARS coronavirus 2. So it's just an idea. Um, I don't know. I mean, it is important because it gives us a, an idea of how COVID-19 emerged. So if we want to prevent future pandemics, we need to understand how this one happened. So what's the mechanism used by bats to transmit any virus to other animals? So again, with viruses, they can be transmitted through body fluids. So the urine, the, fe the fecal matter, the saliva, um, the aerosols in potentially can all transmit it. With rabies, it's going to be saliva. That's the way it gets through. But it seems like with this coronavirus, it's mostly like a respiratory infection. So maybe you inhale it. Um, so that's the most likely scenario for how bats can uh, transmit the virus.
So question, ¿por qué no es uh, conveniente? Oh gosh, I'm very sorry for this. This is me trying to read in Spanish. Um, ¿Por qué no es conveniente en, en I can't pronounce this word. <laughs> Okay, I'm just going to translate it into English as I read it. So, um, okay, actually, I'm having really trouble translating. Yes, yes, uh, I, I can help. So it's something uh, like uh, to inhibit ACE2 yes. receptors? Yes, or why it is not convenient to inhibit uh, ACE2 receptors? Uh-huh. Or okay, so mismo. Or what means the? So I think he ju he just put like what. I'm guessing. Uh, I think he translated ACE two to what? Uh, to this. Uh, ACE two. Yeah, to what it means in Spanish. So oh. it says. Uh, uh, to avoid that the virus. Uh, adheres to the human cells. Uh, no, I think that's a great approach for stopping the virus if you target the receptor. Um, and I think people are trying to develop uh, vaccines that can prevent it from binding to the receptor. So does the virus mutate when it infects human cells? Yes, every time a virus uh, makes more copies of itself, it has a potential to make an error. And those errors are gonna be small changes, but you know those are considered mutations. So it can be a small mutation, but it still is able to mutate. And the same thing with our cells, like every time we make another, every time our cell like undergoes like mitosis, it, tries to copy everything like 100% correctly, but there could be errors. Now, every cell has a way to repair it, but with viruses, they don't. They make a mistake and it's just, this what it is. So it will have the mutation. Um, Jasmine, if you wish to pick the last three questions, uh, that could be. Oh, okay. Sure. So the first one is, do you think studying the immune system of bats will lead us to some discovery that can help us um, stay healthy as it happens in bats? And yes, I hope so. So the idea is we share things in common um, at, at a very simple mechanism. So if things that are common between us and a bat, if there's a difference in a bat and that makes them healthy, can we take that difference and move it into ourselves? And then do we become healthy? So I think that's totally feasible and reasonable and I hope that's the direction that we go. Um, there's this, another question in Spanish. I can translate that. Uh, is there a possibility that the virus of SARS-CoV-2 combines with other virus and endemic viruses in humans and mutate to a new type of virus. I mean, <laughs> it is possible a virus can recombine. So this idea of viral recombination, but it requires very special circumstances. Like a cell has to have multiple viruses that are really similar to each other. So maybe a, a SARS coronavirus two and a SARS coronavirus, the original, both infecting the same cell and maybe they like are close enough, but it has to be that kind of circumstance. Um, oh, why is the internet full of fake news saying the virus was created in the lab? I mean, how is that possible? So this, this fake news happened from, I think just, misinterpreting um, what the scientists are doing. So the bat coronavirus that was from the horseshoe bat from 2013, that sample was collected and the scientist who collected that sample took it to her lab so she could sequence it. 
So we know that the sequence came from a lab, right? And this was the platform for spreading this idea that it was lab made because it was a sample that was in a lab. And that's kind of how the fake news started to spread around of like, well, you had the coronavirus sample in the lab, so you must have released it intentionally and got people sick. So that's kind of where um, the science, the, the scientific method kind of like falls apart when people don't really understand the process. So that's kind of what happened, I think. Okay, so I think that's that's good. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Thank you, Jasmine, a lot yeah. for uh, this very interesting talk. Um, we're very happy to that you took the time to give us this talk. Yeah, thank you again for the opportunity. I had a blast. Yeah, so uh, we will see. Uh, so thanks everyone who joined us. We will meet again next Wednesday for another talk about, now it's about mental health and what are the implications during this pandemic. It's very interesting. We're trying to give you different angles of this, these times that we are living, we are all living. Este, pues nos vemos la próxima semana. Muchísimas gracias. Ahora ya vamos a terminar la sesión. Y bueno. Este, gracias, Jasmine. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> gracias. <laughs> Adiós. Adiós.